All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Pfeiffer. This is Conversations on Retail. We're so glad you're here today as Susie Monfort kicks off a brand new group and series called People, Planet, and Profit, Retailing's Triple Bottom Line. And her guest for this very first uh, episode, if you will, is Emily Ma, the head of Food for Good at Google. And we are so excited that she is here. Before we get started, just a quick um, a call out to our sponsors. Got a couple of great sponsors that have uh, sort of chipped in for this series. First is West Rock Coffee, great company based in Little Rock, Arkansas, that does amazing work all over the, all, all over the globe. You can check out westrockcoffee.com. And then a brand new sponsor we picked up called Ventros, that does some amazing work in the HR space to anonymize applications and resumes. Really a fascinating company. So I'd encourage you to learn more about each of them. The last thing I would say is this is intended to be a conversation and not a presentation. And we would love for every one of you who's joining live to participate in that conversation. The best way to do that is as uh, as you have questions to ask or insight to offer, simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of Zoom. Uh, Susie and I will see those questions as they come. We'll be able to moderate those as time allows. So thank you so much, uh, Susie and Emily, and I'll let you take it from here. Awesome. Thank you. Virtual hug, Emily. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for launching summer with me. Of course. You got us. Love it. <laughs> it's summer solstice. Long it's the summer solstice. Yay. It's so wonderful to see you. Oh my gosh. Okay. We have so many things to talk about. But Matt, our the man behind the curtain, has been okay. You've got an hour trying to cram it in, but okay. he, I am so 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 appreciative of you, Emily. Um, so let me just give a little bit about uh, myself and a little bit about People, Planet, and Profit. So I'm Susie Monford. In case I haven't met some of you all that are watching live and are going to see this in the future, um, I've spent um, nearly 30 years. It's hard to believe uh, working in consumer facing industries first in retail for the sharper image. Then I spent about 10 years running and growing a restaurant company that was based in San Antonio, Texas. And we worked across the state of Texas, one of the very first fast casual chains in the United States. I learned a lot. I learned how to peel onions really quickly and I learned how to cook a pizza and a wood fired brick oven and all kinds of cool stuff. Mostly I learned a lot about leadership though and communication and What's a go-to-market strategy and hmm, economies of scale, all those things that I didn't really learn as an economics major at University of Texas. Um, so did all that. Then I got into this absolutely fascinating world of grocery retailing and supermarket retailing, which has literally taken me around the world. It, it's hard to follow Susie, by the way. She's an incredible individual. I, I, the feeling is mutual here. Uh, and I... Um, I'm a technologist by training and spent many, many years doing product design, doing design thinking, doing innovation work, and then found my way uh, to Google because I had a number of colleagues who were very interested in really sort of long-term bets. Like, what does it mean to really build like technologies that are you know going to be uh, widely adopted 10 years from now? So 10 years ago, um, it was self-driving cars were a pipe dream, for example, right? So, you know, <laughs> the earliest self-driving cars uh, would drive themselves in the fences, right? Like they, they really didn't know where they were going. And now you can hail a self-driving car um, in Arizona, in San Francisco, and a number of other cities in the country, just like you would hail a taxi, right? And so um, it's it's been an interesting journey at Google for the last uh, 10 years or so. I've been here for 10 years. I'm playing a number of different roles um, on the business side, on the technology side. And I had the honor of meeting Susie because uh, I became very interested in food. So the reason for this, and you're like, what does Google have to do with food? Like, it's an advertising company, it's a technology company, it's an internet company. Um, uh, just a couple of really interesting stats here. So at Google, we produce about 300,000 meals a day because we decided as a company 25 years ago that it was really important to support our staff, right? It turns out that, um, you know, to head off healthcare costs downstream and productivity losses downstream, if we can... Uh, upfront invest in really good lunch for everyone. Um, that actually helps everybody be healthier and more productive. So it was an investment. We've learned a lot by serving 300,000 meals a day for quite some time. Um, the second thing is we have incredible partners like Susie at Kroger, you know, all of the big and small food companies, restaurants, beverage organizations, ag organizations, somehow interact with Google in some way, whether it's on the advertising side, whether it's other digital tools, 
And then finally, um, it turns out that people search the internet about food all the time, right? So uh, one of the most popular searches on Google Maps is, you know, find food near me, right? So, you know, when you're looking for a local restaurant within, you know, a five minute drive, like, you know, you you might be typing into Google, tell me what's nearby, right? Um, same, same, you know, a lot of people are like, show me a chicken recipe on YouTube. But it turns out that chicken recipes are really, really popular, like 40 million views uh, on YouTube. You're like, what? Right. And so, um, you know, Google has a lot to do with food and we've learned a lot about food because it's a really, really big topic. I mean, it's the one thing that glues all of us together, right? All 8 billion people on earth, all of us need to eat. And so it's through that common experience. All of us have a different lived experience around food, but this is a common experience that we realized uh, we got to get a little smarter about. So uh, long story short, did a lot of work on internet balloons, self-driving cars, smart glassware, smart eyewear. And then eventually I realized how important our food system was and decided to really dig in. Um, and, you know, thanks to mentors like Susie, you know, got to over the years um, work on everything from, you know, enhancing transparency in the food system to reducing food waste to moving towards a more circular economy of food, really enabling choice for folks while also focusing on planet, right? Like whether it's shifting diets or creating a more sustainable food system, those are all really important things as we look to what does it mean to feed 10 billion people? I mean, like our world population is going to increase by another 2 billion in the next 10 years. So we got to get ready for that. And our food system currently is amazing for so many reasons, but it does need to transition to something that doesn't necessarily look like what it is today if we truly are going to like add another 2 billion people to Earth. And so um, to quickly talk about what our team does, um, we are a community of folks across the company, um, across all of our different you know sort of business units, whether it's YouTube or cloud or our foundation or search that looks at food security and tries to understand what can we contribute. So there's four ways we contribute. Number one is we think a lot about technology and data because we're nerdy technologists and data people. So we like to find ways to, you know, deliver better search results when somebody is searching for free food or food support, right? Or when somebody, when a grocer comes to us and says, you know, how can we really fine tune understanding supply and demand? Like we can bring some tools around predictive analytics there. So technology, right? Um, I myself have done a lot of work on open source technology because I believe that in a future world, uh, it's important not to have everything be proprietary. The secret is most of the internet was built on open source technology. So if you don't know what Apache is, check that out. Um, the second domain out of four is process. So I've spent a lot of team learning about our own internal system that produces those 300,000 meals a day. I myself have cooked in our kitchens. I learned a lot, just like Susie peeling onions. And I would be responsible for peeling like 100 pounds of potatoes between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. I learn a lot when you are on the ground in the kitchen that way. Um, and so uh, our team uh, was responsible for figuring out the strategy and the sort of global pledges that Google has made around reducing food waste. Um, and that's a very, very comprehensive strategy over the course of the next three years, uh, really process oriented. The third domain is we do spend some time thinking about policy and really stepping up where we can. And so in the most recent days, um, it turns out that the Build Back Better plan and um, some of the legislation that's gone through at the federal level is really helping municipal governments find ways to do more composting, right? Like, I mean, one of the, by the way, uh, if uh, I can put a plug in for reducing food waste, um, the, I think, number one or two largest vo by volume item in our landfills today is food waste, and it automatically generates methane. You can't even capture it because by the time the food has decomposed and generated its methane. Um, that's when you can go in and cap a landfill and capture the methane. And so if we are really truly going to try to reduce our emissions, reducing food waste is a big part of that. So supporting policies like stepping up to the food waste action plan from a couple of years ago, Google was a signatory because we believed it was so important to basically fund municipalities to do more composting. And then the final domain that we spend time on is um, you know, sort of moving capital, right? So a couple of ways I work with our foundation to really support hunger relief organizations that are not just perpetuating the system, but looking for innovative ways to shorten the line, so to speak, right? Our goal is not to continue perpetuating this emergency system that existed. And Susie and I saw eye to eye the very first time we met on that. Our goal is eventually to actually shorten the line and like actually eliminate hunger in our lifetimes. And I still believe that's possible. 
And then the second thing with capital for us is really um, like catalyzing innovation where there isn't a lot of catalytic funding. So I'm very proud that we were able to step up to support ReFed in a catalytic grant fund that they set up to help really bridge the gap between some of these organizations that are able to find sort of seed funding and form of grants, but can't then go after debt or venture financing because there is a gap, right? So, um, you know, a lot of capital is needed to shift our food system to something that's more sustainable, that's really about people, planet, and profit. And Google is stepping up wherever we can um, in those four ways. So technology, process, policy, and capital are the four things that we work on. So you've got plenty of time to run out for a mani-pedi in the middle of your work. <laughs> well, I do all everything simultaneously. <laughs> oh my gosh, all of that, you all in world peace. Now, I, I'm not being cheeky about it. Emily, that's, that's really extraordinary. And what you just said uh, struck, a few things struck me. Um, what you said about methane gas, you know, the the meatless Monday sort of trend started um, by not necessarily the vegetarians and vegans, but a lot of people who are trying to reduce carbon footprint and, and, and you know, sort of help the environment. And yet we all need to recognize that as consumers, 30% uh, of all food purchased at a supermarket is wasted, is not eaten at home. 30%, 30%. I uh, spoke to Wall Street Journal not too long ago and just said, because they called and said, hey, could you chat to us about inflation? I said, you betcha. So we talked about inflation, which is we've had a 40-year high of inflation, as everybody knows. We're in this shared journey over the last six months. It's starting to ease a little bit, but we're not back there. But I also I said, yes, let's recognize inflation. At the time, it was only 7%. It has got higher. Now it's come back down. Um, but I said, let's also remember that 30% of our food dollar in general is going to waste. So that is... 4x, 5x, what the standard inflation is at any one given time. You add that to the point that you're making about composting, which takes me back to, I just want to highlight, when Emily and I met, I, I can I can harken back right, right now, Emily. We are on the sixth floor in the conference room at Kroger, at, at GEO. And I, I think I've been back to back in meetings. I'm like, oh, good, the Google team's coming. I get a little brain food, a little brain break. Um, and in, and then it was introduced. I'm like, oh my goodness, we're here to talk about making a better food bank. And listen, nothing against that. I, when I had been president at uh, Quality Food Center in Seattle, I was on the executive board of the food bank out there, as well as another foundation that was meant to help feed children that were in need and, and food insecure. But it hurts my heart. And I have this positive tension. Of course, you help folks in the immediacy of it, but we need the brain power focusing upstream at the root cause. And so I think I listened, to, hopefully politely, to the introductions. And then I raised my hand. I said, are we here to talk about making a better food bank? You all, Emily Ma, across the big, serious boardroom table in the big room, jumps up, no, I gotta go. And that's when we became friends for life. Um, because you're right, there's so many things that we can do better. And as a retailer around the world, I've had opportunity to work in the U.S. and Australia and the U.K. and Canada. That's my mission is how do we become better retailers? Um, and because if we can be better in the middle and then if we can go back downstream, we can help the farmers. And then if we go up, you know, further upstream all the way to shelf and table, we can help people and their communities eat, live a better, healthier life. So anyway, um, but I want to just punctuate that, Emily, but... Spot on, spot on. And to build on that, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about retail recently, and it's so interesting. I have a, a former real estate professor of mine, his name is Doug Abbey, Professor Abbey out there, who's just amazing. Thank you for your influence. You know, he just talked about how right now we can buy everything from our couch, basically, right? It's a couple of, you know, clicks, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's talking right now. You don't know. I know. I know. Like you could have bought an entire week's of grocery, like, you know, without me watching during those podcasts. And and yet, you know, it's so interesting, you know, at least in the U.S., I know there's a lot of people who are, you know, like struggling with loneliness, like struggling with like, you know, positive mental health, all those things. And um, I think people are seeking to be together again. I was, you know, just out and about recently and, you know, the whole entire retail food, beverage, restaurant sort of sector is really bringing people back out, right? Like it's so vibrant. Like people are seeking community. People are seeking experiences that are in real life, right? Like the digital space is incredibly convenient and unbelievably 
sort of efficient in certain ways, but we're losing something from it. And I think people want to be reconnected with their food to be able to hold something and to smell it and to feel it before, you know, they they purchase it. And they're, the role of retail is shifting for sure. But like when we you know, sort of want to find our way back to community, when we want to find our way back to our understanding of sort of climate and planet, we have to live in the physical reality of things, not in the digital reality of things. And I, I'm saying that working for an internet company. So this is legit. <laughs> well, you're 100%. And, but you're the heart and soul. And, and really, Google is such a fascinating family, culture, organism. Um, and it is into everything. And you've really taught me a lot about how we just, you've taught me to how to even think or dream about how do we build data exchanges to affect a better world. And so um, so for the purpose of today, because um, we could talk about a lot of things. Um, oh, but before we move off of that, sorry, we recently got to see each other when you were in town by South by South by Southwest uh, here in Austin. We got to have a awesome Paloma at the Sour Duck. Yay. Um, what I meant to ask you. So we uh, when we were at South by, we watched the premiere of uh, the F future of food. Is that out yet? Because I wanted to make sure I shared that with all of our yeah. That's right. I believe so. So, um, you know, shout out to um, uh, Roy Steiner over at Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, they created this incredible film that goes around the world from China to, I believe it was Peru or Brazil um, to, you know, Europe sort of looking at all like I don't think we live in one food system. I think we, we live in a, a world where there's many different kinds of food systems that we can learn from. And uh, you know, the, just the Rockefeller Foundation did a fabulous job sort of telling the story of what our food system could look like in 2050. So I'll we'll make sure to share that link at the very yeah, end. Yeah, I to do some homework after and look that up because I had chatted to a few friends here in Austin about it. It was incredible. It even showcased a lot of our own Native Americans, how, how they used to be hunter-gatherers. So, um, all right, so enough of that. So let's flash forward to a very fun time in all of our lives. Um, I'm living in Cincinnati, um, group vice president, actually now of e-commerce working for Kroger and the pandemic sets in. And remember that, oh my gosh, I, I still think we're living in it. I think it's just slowly dissipating um, because again, it feels very visceral, very visceral to me. Um, I was living in, in a new town that was pretty new to me. We all were working out of our homes suddenly a night and day. And so I'm in my house trying to run e-commerce in a time that we needed to run e-commerce. And I just start kept thinking, and one day in the middle of the, middle of the day in the East Coast, it struck me, um, I was thinking about the food economy, and literally I'm watching it sort of organically disconnect right in front of my eyes. I mean, everything we are doing at Kroger, and by the way, I've never been more proud to be a grocer than all through the pandemic, and been so grateful to be a grocer because I had a way to help. I had a way to at least feel like I was doing something you know, to help get food to people. And it just, it was something that gave me some uplift every day, frankly. Um, but I was thinking about all this, the kind of organic way that the food economy had come together over decades was falling apart because suddenly we had farmers who couldn't, who couldn't harvest crops. If they could, they had no supply chain to bring them the, their pro crops to market. Meanwhile, we had this bizarre phenomenon, as we all know, all of a sudden, we had a massive increase in food insecure folks um, who were out of work. Um, we had food banks, uh, thank God for them, but they were overtaxed. But and we also had a new entire population, millions of people who had been displaced from jobs because all the restaurants shut down. At the same time, we're trying to stand up grocery stores and we're labor constrained. So every, and I know you know this, um, and I thought about this one day and I thought about the New Deal um, I think I had seen something that World Central Kitchen had been doing, and I literally just said, that's it. And I called Emily, and Emily, you answered, and we started chatting. And that began a series, you convened thought leaders from around the world, um, and we had great conversations with folks. And anyway, I'll, I'll let you describe it. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, let me stop talking and pitch it to you. That was a real moment for me. You literally answered the phone, and I said, Emily... Everything is breaking apart. What can we do? What can we do with Kroger Zero Hunger Zero Waste Foundation? What can we do writ large? And I called you and you said, yep, let's do it. Oh my gosh. 
Oh, it's it was such a beautiful moment. I think the pandemic, if anything, I wouldn't wish it on anyone ever again. But I think sometimes in a moment of crisis, you know, crisis is too good of an opportunity to lose. And I think it forced you and me and so many folks who came to the table those days to sort of just grapple with some of the things that we had taken for granted, grapple with some of the sacred cows that maybe were not so sacred anymore about how things worked, and maybe like really take an opportunity to re-envision what a future could look like where, again, going back to people, planet, profit, you know, what would a new deal look like, right? I know, you know, Jose Andreas went to the Hill and spoke about, you know, as a chef, like he was seeing exactly what you were seeing. I, I, it's shocking to me that there's like 10 million people working in, you know, restaurants in this world, right? And so many of them are essential. And yet, by the way, something like 35% of restaurants never came back after the pandemic because they're like paycheck to paycheck businesses. They're like, they're 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 the cornerstone of our communities and yet like they're tough businesses to run and so you know for for me i remember those three or four conversations we had with people from across the the different sectors and susie i learned so much from you you know right now like we have grown and grown and grown to eight billion people on earth and in the united states over the past 50 years to become more and more and more efficient right so your description of the food service supply chain, the ones that feed into restaurants, the one that feeds into sort of quick serve and whatnot, is very different than the one that feeds in the grocery. And we're like, wow, you know what? Very efficient, allowed those two sort of supply chains and value chains to grow very quickly. Um, but like when things kind of fell apart during the pandemic, they weren't able to work together as well, right? So, you know, very, very sort of straightforward, right? Many of you are from retail on this call, right? It's impossible to take like a bulk pack of like 50 pound of flour and like stick it on the store shelf and sell it to your customers in a grocery store, right? Mm -hmm. So there wasn't this interconnectivity that existed. And for me, if anything came out of those conversations, it's right. We, we need to aim for a future food system that is not only incredibly successful as businesses, but also support the people and also have the resiliency because, by the way, I don't think that's going to be the only pandemic we're going to see in our lifetimes. I think we're going to have similar kinds of shocks like pandemics, whether it's flooding or fires or whatnot. And, you know, the the world economic system was built to basically assume certain levels of stability. Yeah. And the food system was built on top of that. And I I think we need to rethink what it looks like to have that kind of resiliency. Well, here's a Matt, uh, our producer has got a view of my my view of what that was, of what we were describing at the time. That's right. This is my, uh, Emily loves this drawing. So in one of our co first calls, I said, Emily, this is how I see it in my head. Mm -hmm. And as you all can see, um, I majored in penmanship <laughs> and I'm a, I should have been a graphic artist. No, actually, true story. I had to stay after school in second grade. The nuns made me stay after school to practice my penmanship, which I think just made it look even more passive aggressive. <laughs> um, this, this was my view. Um, and then just to show you the difference, uh, let's look at the real view, uh, the Emily Molly view. So I <laughs> and it's really held up my piece of paper on a call. And Emily goes, yeah, yeah, give me a second. Typed. And then she sends me this slide. Um, but yeah, let's just talk through this for a moment because we're not there. Um, and one thing we're, we're, we're not there yet as a world, you, what you're working on many, many elements of this, I am working on elements of this yeah. through all the different companies and partners that I'm, uh, I'm advising, but I still believe this is the golden, uh, the golden blueprint, if you will. But, um, I'm going to let you talk through this, but it's all and this. That's what I meant earlier. I'm. It's all seriousness. The idea of a data exchange, because what you just said before, the reason it doesn't work is there was no data exchange. We would sit at Kroger and running fresh food, I would call um, Cisco Food Systems and say, hey, I know you've got all this inventory that you can't sell because your restaurants have shut down. Can you come deliver to our warehouses? I mean, so anyway, but Emily, you're smiling, but this is, this is the blueprint. Oh, gosh. Well, you know, I remember this so vividly because when uh, Susie sent me her sketch, it actually reminded me of something that Chef Andrew Zimmern once said. 
So Chef Andrew's very famous because he's a TV personality of anything. Uh, just some great stuff going on there. He said that the food system is like a Mobius strip. You know, guys, the Mobius strip, it looks like this continuous surface that somehow magically continues, right, is infinite. Um, the food system is not just one thing, right? You can start in like supply chain and end up in health. You can start with health and end up in policy. You can start in policy and you can end up talking about community and jobs, right? And so it is all of these like overlaid with one another. And if one piece is affected, the whole thing is affected. It's a system. It's a, it's, it literally is like, like, I mean, you cannot do one thing without the other. And I think right now, Again, as I had mentioned, we had very focused, we became very focused as a society um, on on sort of optimizing each element, bringing them back together again with the infrastructure around how we share information, how we sort of rework physical flows of food, how we like move money around becomes really, really important. And so, you know, again, a hat tip to, um, you know, an old mentor of mine who talked about, you know, how information flows, how capital flows, how physical things flow. Like all of those things are important. And we don't necessarily have that language right now, nor the infrastructure to look at all of those signals as they move. Right. So if I think about it just in a really concrete terms, right, like um, I live here 80 miles from um, one of the most productive regions, agricultural regions in the country. So strawberry capital of the world here, like so literally in um, Salinas down south. And so um, what does it take? You know, and also Susie and I talk a lot about strawberries because it's like the like a very important thing for a grocer to have their strawberries. Right. But they like go bad really quickly. So it's also the most um, challenging item, I think, if not one of the most challenging items you have on your store shelves. And so what does it take for, um, you know, Driscoll's and one of its growers to basically harvest and then inspect and then ship something across the country from, you know, California to a grocery store, let's say, you know, on the East Coast in New York. Wow. Um, it requires information. Right. So when do we harvest and do we have labor? <laughs> because that's not guaranteed. Right. You know, how do we get the information out there that we want to harvest a plot because it rained early yesterday and we didn't expect that. Right. It requires capital. It requires a buyer on the other end, you know, Kroger, for example. Right. To commit to a large truckload of strawberries and then to sell it. Right. And it requires a truck. Right. It requires like the food to be moved. And so um there are breakdowns in all three of those things that mean that, to Susie's point earlier, we're not losing food just, you know, from households. We're losing food along the way, right? Like there are entire truckloads of tomatoes that get dumped in the border in Mexico right now, like because whatever happened coming through, because, you know, transportation fell through or the buyer fell through or whatever it might be. And so because of these disconnects of information flows around the product itself, the transportation and the physical items, and then also the money, like we're not necessarily making the most ideal decisions along the way as business owners, as sort of executives who are operating these very, very complex systems. We're working with incomplete information. That's right. Matt, would you maybe bring that back up, bring the Emily version back up just for a second? Um, Emily, you've talked a couple of, you mentioned a couple of times um, how we move, quote unquote, move the money around. Um, I know what you mean, but maybe will you just double click into that for a bit so that people can understand what you, what sp precisely what you're talking about? <laughs> well, you know, Susie, you've been in this business way, way longer than I have. Uh, at the end of the day, um, it's interesting. Uh, l let me maybe by example, uh, talk about how difficult it is in some ways technology has come to solve it. So I have a, a colleague of mine, a group of us at Google, have been working very closely with a company called Bushel, right? Um, right now, something like 30 to 40% of all grain transactions now run through the Bushel software platform. Um, why? Um, because right now, um, well, before, okay, so some time ago, right, if you imagine if, let's say I'm a grain farmer, right, I'm a wheat farmer, right? Um, I'm going to go take my wheat and I'm going to stick it in the local silo and I'm going to freaking wait, pardon my language. I'm going to wait, sometimes two weeks, sometimes four weeks. Somebody's going to pick it up. 
somebody's going to then somebody's going to deliver it to my buyer or the buyer's going to inspect it and eventually knock on wood i get a check in the mail that's yep. a lot of risk for me to take on right yes special using digital footprints and uh digital tools basically makes that payment automatic so they're allowing the grand transactions to move much more quickly farmers get paid more quickly they can then in reinvest in their people they can reinvest much more quickly with less risk in equipment in sort of soil health whatever it is that loop needs to be closed and capital flows right now because especially in food and ag for the most part um I would say a lot of it, well, actually McKinsey wrote a report, I think in 2017, 28, that basically listed every single industry on earth and was like, food and ag is the least digitized. Yep. Capital doesn't flow very efficiently through food and ag. And it means that certain parts of the supply chain taking on more risk than they need to, and it makes the system brittle. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And everywhere it's brittle, it can it breaks very easily and it's extremely costly and risky. Um, so maybe let's just sort of touch on some of these axes, some of these points around the diameter. You know, in my early in my food, early in my supermarket career, it was the health, wellness, and nutrition and fitness as yes. sort of leading into because it's 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 who I am. Um, it's who I am. It's what I believe in. It's it's the lifestyle that I'm work the balance I always work to achieve. But it was it was the most broken thing in my more narrow purview when I first started. And by that, I mean, I started in the grocery business working for HEB Central Market. We homemade food from scratch in, in every store every and everything was terrific. Later, being promoted around through grocery and selling packaged food, I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, at the time, my sister had just had her first child, my my Kate, my whom I now refer to as my baby niece. Um, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we can't feed the kids this packaged stuff that I'm now selling. So I had this tension. So I, that's where I first started to lean in. Of course, now we know, we learned that our gut health informs all of our other health, our brain health, our emotional health, how we can interact with the world. So to me, I can I could run down that trail much more comfortably because it's more of a, a lot more knowledge. Um, and more, more, I've had more education. I mean, I've become a certified health coach and all those things. Community, I can I can feel, I can touch. You know, I loved running PCC community markets in Seattle, where triple bottom line company, people, planet, profit. I can relate to all that. Some of the others, transportation. I think you know. Well, you know Mark Baum, Emily, quite well with FMI. Whether it's transportation or policy, FMI really plays across both of those. So anyway, I don't want to go all around the horn, but. Is there anything new or emerging that's post, you know, post pandemic that you think is going to help um, scale or accelerate some improvements in any one of these folks? Oh, gosh. Well, I want to go back and give you a hat tip, Susie, for your work in um, health in particular. And, you know, it's it's so interesting to me um, that you found that early in your career and continue to champion it. I want to just shout out, like give you a shout out for that because at the end of the day, um, I can exercise like six hours a day, but if I'm eating a terrible diet of like French fries and like soft drinks, I'm not going to be healthy. Yeah. And it's so connected. It's so connected. Exercise and nutrition and like just overall well-being. By the way, like I could also exercise a lot and eat a healthy diet, but if I'm stressed, right? If I'm deeply stressed and I haven't found that mental well-being and spiritual well-being, I'm also not healthy. And right. so the holistic nature of this is it's really complex. And I think the world generally has a hard time grappling with it because it's so interconnected, but it is. We have to accept the fact that it's super interconnected. Um, at the end of the day, you know, if I sort of get really excited about the future, um, you know, we've talked about tech, we've talked about data, and I know what's on everyone's minds. I know everybody's like, oh, well, what are you thinking about AI? Like, what's your perspective on AI? Because you work for an AI company. Um, well, it's it's fascinating. Google has been AI first for a very long time. And AI is actually, uh, in my mind, I'll be really honest, very boring. It's supposed to be, <laughs> it's supposed to be the worst boring thing on earth. By the way, you know, when you type in a Google search and it somehow ends up finishing your sentence, you've typed in like, 
you know, find me a nearby, you know, pizza and it finishes off parlor, right? Like that's AI, right? Because we're pretty sure that given like the billions of searches that happen on Google every second, that because most people finish that sentence off with parlor, like we're going to finish up with parlor. That's basically AI. It's very boring, extremely boring. Um, a lot you of people unlocking any of these. Sorry. Uh, yes, of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, a um, couple of things when it comes to artificial intelligence and food, um, I really think it's the same big theme. Um, AI for me is meant to, and for Google in general, is really meant to unlock the creativity for folks, right? So, um, you know, just like, um, you know, right now, I, I literally take an email I've written and I'd be like, please write this for somebody who is, you know, um, you know, I, I, my niece is like currently, you know, 16, right? So I'm like, take this gobbledygook I've written and please kind of rewrite it for me for somebody who's 16 and embellish it with like things that she's probably interested in, like, you know, celebrities, TV shows, whatever. Right. I can go in as a chef and be like, hey, can you take the spaghetti bolognese recipe and maybe add some Indian influence? Right. Like AI is meant to be a really fun, creative tool to help us explore faster. And um, that's the like when it when I look at these domains, like that is the one that I'm most excited about. Like, what could we like? Let's take healthcare for example, right? Like, imagine Susie, if you can, let's say you were coaching me on health, right? Like, you could type into a generative AI, um, like ChatGPT or Bard or any of those tools out there, and be like, you know, Emily is, you know, like loves being outdoors in nature. Her favorite trails are X Y Z. She prefers to do things on the weekends with her husband. Can you please put together a 20-week plan for her to run a marathon? Right, right. So so you can start to use AI to kind of draft some potential scenarios for you rather than having to come at, with all of it on your own. You could use that for health. You could be like, draft that 20-page plan or that 20-week plan, right? What's she going to eat? Right. What's she going to do every day? Right. And it will start to kind of come up with some ideas for you. And then you become the person who refines it. Right. As the expert, because AI is good for certain things, but not for everything. Now, let me back up on the tech side. I think there's some really big opportunities still. I'm going to look at transportation on the other side of the screen for a second. Um, I used to say a long time ago when I was working on self-driving cars that the most underutilized asset class on earth were vehicles, right? So here's why. There's um, about a billion vehicles on the road. And uh, un for uh, the sort of personal car use side, like how how much did you drive your car today, Susie? Today? None at all. Right? Okay. Maybe, you know, average person in the United States maybe commutes one hour a day, right? So Cars are only being used, like actually used 5% of the time. Like as an asset, utilization rate, 5%, yep. right? You're like, oh my God, like what the heck? Like we are using all of the resources in the world, all of the space to park our cars and it's only being used 5% of the time, right? Like what the heck, right? So it's not nearly as bad when it comes to the commercial side of vehicles, but there's so much opportunity to optimize the vehicle fleets that currently currently exists. So we work with for-profit and non-profit organizations at Google to basically, rather than buy another truck and hire another driver, right? It's like, oh, you've got 25 trucks to run your small-scale regional grocery business. Can you, instead of buying yet another truck or two and doing capital planning around that and hiring more drivers, can you just reroute this so that you could actually squeeze more out of the lemon, right? So you've got 25 trucks. You can still cover all those routes and grow another 20%, right? So I think there's still untapped, extremely boring opportunities around using um, like predictive analytics and optimization tools and routing tools to sort of get on the sort of commercial and supply side of things. Um, so overall, I will say one thing, though, like I think a lot of people are like, oh, my goodness, like there must be some really, really scary downfalls around tech and data. And I, I'll admit to you, I think there's some things that I'm I am worried about going back to your point about packaged foods and how you're worried about you know, being a grocer and selling those foods into the world. Um, we talk a lot now about like ultra processed foods, right? Um, I think 
you know, in certain cases, AI will accelerate that, right? We're going to be experimenting with chemistries and things like that, that worry me, right? Looking at the time, there's two two other topics I'd love to cover while, while I still have you, if you stay for a few more minutes. Yeah. Um, and I did love that, uh, what you said about transportation, because that means I have a good excuse to buy another new bicycle since I don't need to, I don't need my car. So I'm going to do that. Um, two things. We chatted last week. Um, you're one of the one of the other hats you also wear, how I don't know, is you're teaching at Stanford. I am super curious. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're teaching, but you know, uh, I, how do you find the students today? Um, how are they feeling? How, how are they feeling? And and what is their perspective on the world and their own prospects? I would just love to some insights um, on yeah, what's that world. Well, they firstly, first uh, shout out to all of you at Stanford. Um, they keep me young. <laughs> I feel like spending more time like you spend with your your baby niece. Um, super important, right? It's just understanding their perspective, spending time with them. They teach me more than I could ever teach them in, in class. Um, I, I'll be honest. I think the pandemic was so difficult for so many of them because, I mean, you and I went to college because we wanted community. We wanted to establish and explore our, you know, sort of grown up identities, but we also wanted community and they were all stuck in their dorm rooms. So I think there was a lot of loneliness, a lot of mental health, health issues in the last couple of years, but I think they're coming around to it. And I think the pandemic along with, I mean, gosh, like the air quality in New York, it's like some of the things that have happened in the last four years from like the skies turning orange in San Francisco to the air quality in New York being the worst in the world for a day last week, you know, um, I think have really caused this new sort of the younger generation to be much more conscious about climate issues, right? They they can't avoid it. They know it's not a hoax because they're literally asked, you have to stay inside because like, you know, the air quality is so bad, you're going to be sick outside. Or like, the pandemic, right? You know, they were watching their friends get sick or they're getting sick. And so these issues are so visceral for them that they have really sort of doubled down on a triple bottom line career, right? A lot of them are like, how can I do well and do good at the same time, right? Like at Stanford, you know, I teach a class called the Entrepreneurship Principles and Perspectives. Um, it's a companion course to the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Series, which uh, we've had some incredible folks come to speak at. Everybody from, you know, Meg, you know, um, uh, sorry, uh, Meg Whitman from 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 uh, HP all the way to, you know, like the youngest mayor of Stockton in the country, you know, like and and at the end of the day, I, I do want to bring it to entrepreneurship because um, the definition of entrepreneurship, according to Peter Drucker at Harvard, is the pursuit of opportunity without regor regard to resources currently under control. Mm -hmm. And we had the blessing for like many decades now, Susie, of operating in a sort of economic environment where it felt like things were stable. It felt like we could like operate within a system that we could rely on. And that meant that we didn't necessarily need to be as entrepreneurial, right? There was there was a little bit more certainty, more guarantees. I think we are entering into an era for the next several decades where there is more uncertainty. There's more volatility. And actually, entrepreneurial mindsets become much more important because we have to be able to build careers and seek opportunity without necessarily the guarantee of success, right? We have to do these things. Like We have to invest in the next generation, even though we might not know how to do it nor have the resources currently to do it. We still have to go at it. So I really appreciate being able to spend time teaching because it is a reminder to me of the ethos and the spirit that I have to carry with me every day when I show up at my day job. So um, if you want, actually, uh, the the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Series is free. We have some great speakers uh, every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. Uh, it's actually streamed, live streamed on YouTube. So uh, we we host great speakers. Um, again, we'll send out that link um, on a follow up. Um, again, you could look up ETL Stan at Stanford and uh, on YouTube, and then it'll pull up all of our past speakers. Oh, I love it! What a gift! Thank you for sharing that. And and that's a, it's a great perspective. And I guess my one last question is: Do you feel like do you ever worry sometimes that um, this the current generation of college age and maybe just out of college? that this this art of what we're doing right now, we're just having a great conversation. We're sharing ideas or being open to new thoughts. Yeah. You know, 
How do you, what's your perspective on that? You were talking about this, you know, um, I think this is a little bit lost. You know, it's interesting when you and I were growing up, it was totally normal for us to like go over to our friend's house and like have a sleepover and, you know, like go hang out, you know, at, at the park or whatever it might be. And I, um, I, I think we've lost a little of that of, in American society. And I worry, I worry. I think one of the most important things that, you know, at least, you know, my co-teachers and I can do in our classes is to encourage that dialogue, right? And by the way, like, you know, we live in a polarized world because we're not in synchronicity when we have conversation. I think sometimes asynchronous communication um, on the internet causes us to be further and further apart. Whereas if we're sitting in a room together, we are naturally more civil and thoughtful with each other, right? Because we are responding. I'm responding to you know, your your reactions, right, along the way, and so are you. And I would love nothing more than to see that come back more. And so I would encourage, if you're an educator out there, um, if you're a leader out there, to encourage this course, right? If, you know, I know it's easier to send an email sometimes, but it's probably less effective than to have a conversation. Like, I'm, it's not just with the younger generation, it's with, with all of us, right? I think we live in a world where it's about efficiency, about, like, asynchronous communication, and we've lost something in that. We're we're unable to sort of hold the ambiguity of two perspectives at the same time. And I think that's so important as we enter a world of, again, uncertainty, challenge, whether it comes to people, planet, and profit. Like all those things are going to be ongoing, dynamic conversations, and they need to be in balance. And the way to keep them in balance is to actually be in dialogue constantly with each other. Constantly. And you're 100 percent right, and an entrepreneur, whether you're in the in the business world, entrepreneurial world, or just your friendship or your relationships. I remember my dad early in my career because growing up, exactly the same. We went and played at each other's houses, and you're just always out with your friends. But it, in business, my dad taught me early on. He goes, you know, Suzanne. When anytime there was a Suzanne, that was when I knew I was supposed to pay attention. But it was always, always, always communicate in person. Yeah. Now. If for some reason you can't do that, this was, you know, then telephone. And all, and if you can't do telephone, only then may you do an email. This is pre-texting. So now, you know, I but I still work to follow that. And it, it does, it makes a big difference. And I think we all appreciate it. Okay. We could talk a lot more about that. I know we're just about out of time. I wanted to ask you one. I Well, I've got like 20 more questions. Want to see my, my messy handwriting? You, um, you've got a list of some of your favorite books and I have read, read over your list. Um, there's so many of them that jump out at me. Can you tell maybe just a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds on guns, germs, and oh, steel? Oh gosh. Jerry Diamond. Is that? Diamond. Um, maybe I'll just hint at, by telling everyone a little bit about the first chapter. Um, it, and, and the, the story goes, um, the author um, went and spent some time with a indigenous tribe. And um, we might look at a group of individuals who live very differently than us as uneducated, right? Because they didn't go through book learning. But they will look at us and be like, there's no way you're going to be able to navigate that jungle without being like bitten by a snake, right? Intelligence comes in so many different forms. And if that book taught me anything is just respecting that, right? Intelligence comes in many different forms. And if it doesn't look like the form of intelligence you're used to, doesn't mean that it's not a form of intelligence. I love it. It's respecting diversity. It's the expectation is that you're omni-intelligent, not just sort of one vertical and deaf and blind to all others. But um, okay, guns, germs, and steel. I didn't write down the author, but that um, that's on the list for everyone to Google. Um, and I will do that because I'm loading up my Kindle on Friday. Actually, I'm taking off for Europe. I'm going to go just about a month on a holiday. I got to go cycling and then a little bit of work in London and Berlin and Prague um, and spend time with my baby niece. <laughs> she hates it when I call her that. She's got, how old is Kate? She's 25. Anyway, and she still will be my baby niece. So I will have a lot of great uh, time to read. So that's top on my list. Emily, you are absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for making time to, for the inaugural uh, conversations on retail, people, planet, profit. Um, it really is everybody. Listen, we have the power. Um, it, how we decide to show up 
is the world, is the community that we end up living in. We have agency. We have the power to show up, be positive, be curious, be open-minded, try to use our power for good, and th- and think, 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 think. The thing I really want this to co- these conversations to be about is kind of like uh, thinking as a service. You know, just start thinking again. Instead of SaaS, software as a service, this is task, thinking as a service. Just think, go grab your best mate, go grab somebody and sit down and have a great conversation. Um, so Emily, I love you. Thank you so much. Uh, you've made my day. You kicked off the summer. The sun is shining now because of you. I so appreciate it. And to all of you out there, please like and share, send us any comments, and we will follow up uh, via chat and via email with any of the notes. So thank you all very much. Emily, be careful. Take care of yourself. Thank you too. Ciao.